OK, I think we can get started now. OK, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on the IHI Call 2 topic on setting up a harmonised methodology to promote the uptake of early feasibility studies for clinical and innovation excellence in the European Union. My name is Catherine and I'm a member of the communications team at IHI and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, so before we get started with formal proceedings, I just want to let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll be publishing it on the IHI website along with the presentation slides and the participant list for those of you who agreed to be part of it. Um, as you probably know, we haven't actually launched this call yet, so all information is, strictly speaking, indicative, and we'll publish the final information on the calls once we have the approval of the IHI Governing Board, which should be coming fairly soon. Um, so on that note, I would like to introduce our speakers. We have Nathalie Seigneret, who is the Scientific Officer at IHI responsible for this project, and she's going to start with a few slides um, kind of introducing IHI, which is obviously brand new. Um, so you have some context, context, and then we will hand over to Andrea Rapagliosi of Edwards Life Sciences, who is going to present the main topic itself. And then we'll come back to Nathalie, and then we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. So Nathalie, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, good, um, good afternoon, everybody. So I hope you can hear me well. We do have a little bit of echo, but it should be OK now. So as uh, Catherine said, uh, in fact, uh, this webinar will focus on this uh, uh, call to topic two that will be presented uh, in a minute by um, Andrea, uh, who is the leader from the industry pre identified consortium. But before that, we felt that it was important again to remember what is IHI program, uh, because that will help you as, uh, as potential applicants to prepare for your presentation. And at the end, we will have again a little bit of uh, uh, discussion about some proposals, the, sum the submission, the submission, I'm on mute? Mm -hmm. No, okay, sorry. Yes, this is the Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, we will have a little bit of uh, uh, a recap on the, some important points on the proposal submission evaluation and some tips from uh, writing a successful proposal. It's important to remember that this webinar will not cover the rules and procedure. We had the specific webinars on that uh, aspect that is already online. The recording and the, uh, the slides are available online and you have here the link, uh, but of course, um, as Catherine said, uh, we can take a couple of questions, but I would certainly refer you to watch to this webinar on the rules and procedure. So IHI, the Innovative Health Initiatives, is a new EU partnership for health that is a partnership between the European Union, represented by the European Commission, uh, and the Healthcare Industry Association. And we have five uh, healthcare industries association, COSI, representing the medical imaging, radiotherapy, Health ICT and electromedical industries, EFPR uh, representing the pharma and uh, together with Vaccines Europe, the vaccine industry, Europa Bio, the biotechnology industry, and MedTech Europe representing the medical technology industry. And this is very important to keep this in mind because our, our general objective of IHI that are uh, listed and um, that are uh, defined in your legislation, it's really to, to, to have a look at uh, all the, the cross-sectoral aspect to turn the health research and innovation into real benefits for patients and society, to deliver safe and effective health innovations to cover the entire spectrum of care, so from prevention to diagnostic to treatment, in particular areas where there is a big uh, unmet public health need, and to make Europe health industry globally competitive. So we really touch on the broad, the broad sense, the whole spectrum of industry, the whole spectrum of, uh, of care, and as well, uh, uh, all the different technologies that are necessary to achieve this. Our strategic research and innovation agenda define further uh, what is uh, IHI with the cross-sectoral approaches that is to facilitate the creation of new products and services to prevent, intercept, diagnose, treat and manage disease and foster recovery more efficiently. So the goal is really to lay the foundation for the development of safer and more effective healthcare products and solutions 
that responds to unmet uh, public health needs and can be implemented into the healthcare system. So, of course, the research that we are supporting by uh, within IHI should remain at the pre-competitive level. However, again, we we we, we will uh, and and again when it will be presented uh, today this uh, this topic will certainly address all the specific objectives uh, that is uh, that are mentioned in our strategic research and innovation agenda. And you can read more about it by looking at the link that is included in this slide. Now, this topic uh, is a two-stage uh, call, and it's again important to remind yourself because on the IHI we are uh, both launching single-stage call and two-stage Call. And of course, there are some differences in the way that uh, the, uh, the the structure is uh, is made and the processes. So here in this two stage call, we do have first the uh, industry uh, predefined um, consortium who really agree among them themselves where they are ready to uh, work together and more importantly, what they would like to work on and commit the budget upfront. And this pre-identified industry consortium uh, elaborate a topic that has gone through a number of iteration within our uh, different uh, advisory bodies and then uh, are approved by your IHI governing board as part of the uh, work program. So once we launch this call that uh, will be presented in a minute, this topic. Um, so we have a first stage, and this is where we, we, we are here for, is because the first stage is for the applicants consortium composed on the various what we so call public partners that can be academics, hospital regulators, special organization, small and medium sized enterprise and for profit legal entity with an annual turnover of less than 500 million who come together and form uh, an applicant consortium and will propose a short proposal in answer to uh, the topic that is uh, released. This short proposal will be um, evaluated by an independent uh, panel of experts. And based on this evaluation, there will be a ranking among the different uh, proposals. And of course, the first ranked uh, proposal will be then invited to merge with the predefined industry consortium in the second stage, where the full proposal will be worked out together, so between the uh, public partners and the private members, in order to uh, um, finalize and submit the full proposal that will then go ahead again uh, being uh, reviewed by an independent uh, uh, panel of, uh, of experts. And if everything goes well, then we enter into the um, grant pre granting phase with the preparation of the grant agreement and the signature of the grant agreement with the uh, coordinator and IHI, and as well as the signature of the consortium agreement between all the partners of the consortium. So this is, in a nutshell, the process of the two stage. So here we are here to to now present the topic and as well for you to start um, uh, for potential applicant to start networking and to start preparing and defining how you can uh, address uh, the objectives of the, 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 the call or topic and prepare a successful short proposal. So now I will leave the floor to Andrea Rabaiosis from Edwards Life Science, who is the lead of the pre-identified industry consortium and who will present you in more detail now the topic that we have in front of us. Andrea, uh, will you share your screen? I will stop sharing mine um, so you can uh, now uh, go through your presentation. Immediately. Let me see. Yeah. Is that okay? I think you need to put it in uh, slide mode, presentation mode. Is what I just did it. Okay. I see the full screen now. Uh, yes, now we can see it properly. Yes, indeed. Okay, you got it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Nagalin. Thanks a lot, Katharina, for the excellent introduction. We were actually two days ago uh, in Brussels for the people. Uh, 
who is in this webinar and was there, but also especially for the one that uh, uh, they were not there. Uh, it's been really a great meeting, uh, extremely lots of interaction, lots of exchange, uh, and, and I was impressed by the organization, I have to say, I have to repeat, uh, and the support that the IHI office has provided uh, to us uh, in order to uh, really materialize this first stage, first part uh, of, of the two-stage call. Uh, so I'm going straight to the to the the topic to present the topic, uh, setting and harmonize methodologies to promote uh, uptake of early feasibility studies for clinical and innovation excellence in the European Union. Which means that at present, uh, we do not have a standardized procedural framework specific for EFS. EFS are legally authorized, but the process, the methodologies, the framework is not yet there and becomes very complicated, very fragmented between member states, may for sure not at the advantage of SMEs or spin off or less uh, organized uh, structure or innovators. Uh, and this is all the sense creating a favorable environment for early stage clinical investigation and remake Europe much more attracted, attractive for investment while maintain in our academic uh, teaching hospital, university hospital, uh, high class, top class uh, clinical uh, development knowledge in the region. I try to move the slides. I don't think they don't move. Let me see. No, we're still seeing your first slide. And I think I'm blocked here. Oh, That's no, it. No, okay. No, no. I have to remember the, I have to remember what I what I click because I click something <laughs> like different, eh? but we, we will do. Background, the challenge of that. First of all. Patient uh, with a med medical need in Europe uh, speeds delay in access. Why, why delay in access if we are talking about early stage research and clinical uh, development? Because time is really an important element in the equation of access. The earlier you, sta you start, the much closer you get downstream uh, the, the, the opportunity for European patients uh, to have access to modern technologies and uh, to innovative uh, technology, especially the one that they have a met medical need or they suffer of condition that today are difficult to treat. We said you, Europe uh, is losing attraction uh, for early clinical trial investment. That is major, there are publication, there are lots of literature, and this is really something that uh, uh, is central because the more you start earlier, the more the scientific, the medical community and the researcher in Europe can get familiarity with new technologies. And being familiar with new technologies, it will make easier further investment to continue the clinical investigation and getting the right experience and understanding of how to utilize new technologies and the value of them. And as such, the European clinical excellence start to struggle to keep the pace with other regions in the world. That's uh, again, has been said, has been reported, there are data there, but not only the classical US, but other parts of the world in the Far East are really accelerated investment there. And our competitiveness in terms of clinical excellence is really lagging behind. And as I said, early feasibility studies are legally doable, but not really uptake. Yes, uh, I'm back, sorry. Hello, why the need, why we think uh, in the 18 months that we were working with the European Commission first, and the, the, the other trade association, industry association, other companies, I will come back on that, and the uh, IHI office, uh, most recently, why the need for a public-private cross-sectorial collaboration? First of all, because the experience 
that other regions of the world, like in US, they show that actually early feasibility studies were boosted, accelerated, and made it possible thanks to private, private, uh, private public-private collaboration and partnership. The second one is because cross-sectorial collaboration should look at the future. We are not, uh, we don't want to put the methodologies to rule the past, but to be open and capture further innovation, for instance, uh, products that are combined products and mix of pharmaceutical and medical device uh, that are already in the pipelines uh, of different research centers and different uh, industry um, research uh, poles. And the value of involved partners with very specific expertise as the beginning. Understand the needs of SMEs, understand the needs of uh, um, spin off from university, understand the needs of startups, understand the needs of uh, academia, and also understand what is doable from a legal point of view, from an ethical point of view. Here we are talking really early clinical investigation, there are multiple dimensions that needs to be factored in centrally, first with patients at the center of all this process. And the earlier we do in a collaborative manner, the better will be the outcome. What we exactly want to do with this public-private partnership we want to set a tested and trial EU methodologies to promote the uptake of early feasibility study in uh, the Union. Basically, three major pillars of what we are expecting in terms of deliverables. One, a set of blueprints, guidelines, templates in line with your regulation. We are not generating new regulation or new legislation. We want to simply make a bit better understanding that the exploitation of what is allowed to do and facilitate the understanding from all the stakeholders or the interested parties, having effective stakeholder networks connected through a European online portal, profit also some disposition of the European MDR, maybe the expert panel, their scientific, their knowledgeable expertise that can contribute uh, and allow the, a fair competition, especially for SMEs and startups. And at the end, once this methodology is put in place uh, and has been agreed by your party, setting some use cases, uh, in other words, pilots, uh, to test and validate the methodologies. We, are, don't, we don't want to do something uh, pure academic, uh, beautiful, uh, excellent, but like a bubble floating in the air that never impact the reality, but actually we want to test and validate these methodologies and see all the lessons learned and how to adapt it. The expected outcomes, as we said, well, the first thing is to have a patient engaging from the start. We are talking about early evidence generation, early stage of clinical investigation, patient should be there from the first moment. We talk about a med medical need, only patient can tell us the technologies that are better delivering to them and they need to be involved in really in the building and the co-building of a process of early uh, investigation. It's also a European-wide and national uh, opportunity to have regulators, HTA bodies, notified bodies, from the early stage, familiarize with the technologies, with the opportunities, and understand the complex regulatory and HTA uh, question that these technologies can uh, put down to the road, but have them from the early stage. Having healthcare professional, hospital researchers, medical society, individual KOLs, really there to improve the clinical excellence as the beginning, bringing their strong disease understanding, uh, their really strong knowledge on how to deliver top quality data and be there in accompany this process. And obviously we want to have uh, health technologies developers, uh, including uh, uh, SMEs, startups, spin-off, uh, as we said, and even making sure that uh, 
they really can bring all the knowledge and the information that they have in order to secure that these methodologies really doable and applicable in the real life setting. What we uh, expect from the outcome is uh, from the applicants, sorry, uh, is really to have uh, the expertise from regulators, healthcare professional, uh, HTA developers, uh, uh, SMEs, uh, research organization, academia bringing in. What does it mean bringing their expertise in? means to co-create a comprehensive view methodologies, so really being in from the first moment, facilitate and activate a sustainable stakeholder networks. Early ideas come really by meeting, by networks, by exchanging information, develop an online portal, portal at European level with, uh, you see, uh, all you need to know and do, but not only that, making sure that all early dialogue and early exchange of scientific information is well framed and conducted at European level, accessible for all, transparent for all, and to run use cases where appropriate. It's a project where the applicant consortium, means the six companies that uh, have put uh, uh, they put uh, 10 million 0.7 euros uh, in in-kind contribution, and we will see that. So this is what we are bringing, legal, ethical, regulatory, R&D, clinical expertise. This is our contribution in kind, and this is the really uh, ability that we may have to propose potential breakthrough technologies uh, across disease area to be tested, and our know-how in dissemination, communication, and in project management. So, as has been uh, uh, clearly stated at the beginning by Natalie, is uh, uh, a two-stage. The industry is bringing uh, 10.7 million in kind, will be matched by the European Union uh, with another 10.7 million uh, euros for public consortium once that the public, uh, once the, the final uh, consortium will be set, I want to take uh, the opportunity to thank uh, the companies, uh, the industry, the innovators that they have accepted to really make this major effort in new building, namely Abbott, Metronic, Gore, Philips, Synthes, as J and J, uh, and us as Edwards. We expect, and this is really indicative, a duration of 48 months. There will be one part of research analysis, one part of methodology development, and one part of use cases, and all the ongoing communication and dissemination. We are not putting limits on the time, uh, but just really very indicative that should be discussed when the public uh, part of the consortium or the partner will be formed over the summer, and we will be able to sit down and entering really in the nitty gritty of the project management altogether. The value of joining uh, uh, the innovative partnership for the public or non-industry sector is really mainly to contribute to the implementing of the innovative healthcare initiative strategic research agenda is really standing up and say, I want to do that. I want to really participate to this transformation, improve patient access and understanding of disease from the early stage, improve quality of clinical evidence, attract clinic, attract, maintain and strengthen clinical excellence in Europe, facilitate the running of the use cases of pilots were relevant in the EFS and facilitate and conduct EFS and, and attract innovation in Europe. I thank you a lot for your uh, attention. Uh, Natalie, uh, you see, uh, for the heard also from, uh, from the IHI office, uh, has been accompanying us. And if you need any further information, uh, please. Uh, to contact Natalie, and uh, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm over here now. Thank, thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for this uh, very uh, 
excellent presentation and clear, except that uh, we, we noticed that on the budget, we might have to revise because uh, the math doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, seem to, to equal, uh, uh, but that's okay. the thing that Sorry we can clarify, don't worry. Um, so um, I will just share um, a couple of uh, last, um, last uh, 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 slide that I would like to present if I manage again to present that. Um, no, so that's next slide. Yes. Okay. So again, we said that uh, indeed this uh, this um, uh, webinar, the purpose is more to 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 look at the con content of the topic. But we felt that it was important just to remind a little bit of uh, information for for you as potential applicant uh, uh, interested in applying. So again, we when we launch the call, we will have all the information about the proposal template that needs to be filled in when you 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 make your your uh, proposal for as a consortium and as you may know if you are familiar with uh, um, with the, the programs of uh, Horizon Europe, we are following a similar approach with the proposal template with a part A that include all the administrative data that needs to be entered in the web form for the portal and the part B that is more the narrative part that will include the section on excellence, impact, quality and efficiency of the implementation. What we really recommend you is to read carefully the instruction that will be in the uh, in this uh, template, because again, even if we are aligned with the Horizon Europe, some of you may know about uh, Horizon Europe template, we do have some specificities that needs really to be considered. And the specificities is because, first of all, we are a public-private partnership and therefore in the, all the elements of the, the proposal needs to be reflected this public-private dimension. So there are some uh, little instructions that uh, guide you in what we would expect under each of the, uh, um, of the uh, section of the template. We do have an annex for the participation type. Of course, this is the, what I'm talking about now is for the short proposal template. Of course, it will be a different template for the uh, full proposal for the successful consortium will, which, which will be invited to the second stage because then here would be more the, the, the full proposal to be devised with the uh, pre-identified industry partners. So now just a, a recap as well on the evaluation criteria, because again, it's important when you build your proposal to know what uh, the evaluators will look at when uh, evaluating each proposal that we receive. The evaluation criteria follow somehow the, uh, the uh, proposal template in the sense that we address the uh, excellence, impact, and the quality of the implementation. Of course, we again remind uh, ourselves that we are at first step, but still under uh, uh, excellence, uh, the, there are a number of uh, things that will have to be addressed, and the experts will look at the clarity and the pertinence of the project objective, the extent to which the proposed work is ambitious and goes beyond the state of the art, and the soundness of the proposed methodology. In terms of impact, that will look at the credibility of the pathway to achieve the expected outcome of impacts specified in the work program and the likely scale and significance of the contribution due to the project. The quality and efficiency of the implementation, of course, we know that in the proposal, and again, this is clearly mentioned in the proposal template, that at this stage would be only an outline because, of course, the full uh, implementation and work plan will be again, prepared at, for the second stage. However, we need to have already some kind of uh, uh, outline and overview of how this will work. And therefore, the experts will look at the quality of the effectiveness of the proposed uh, um, outline work plan and the capacity on the role of each participant and the extent to which the consortium as a whole brings together the necessary expertise. And Andrea has uh, really uh, well uh, presented why we need everybody around the table to be in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, project 
Uh, so we, we, of course, need to have all the expertise necessary to fulfill the objective. Now, a couple of tips for the applicant. So I said already before, but uh, read all the call uh, relevant material, especially the topic text. So again, as we mentioned for the moment, it's not yet on uh, the, the, the full topic uh, text is not yet on the website, but will be very shortly and the call will be very shortly officially launched. So again, even if you have seen previous draft, make sure to read when we, uh, we launch the full topic and we launched the call. Um, for, you need to, to, to form the uh, consortium early. So of course it's easy to say, it's maybe less easy to do it in practice, but it's very important now that uh, having this, this thoughts and being this, uh, this presentation to really start thinking on how you think the consortium should be built and always think of the public-private partnerships. So, and having in, in, this in mind that uh, the public, uh, uh, the private members will join in the second stage. Ensure that all the information requested in the call text and in the proposal template is provided, because that's really the only elements that will be judged by the experts. So of course, they have to look at the uh, proposal as it is submitted, as it is written, not with the thought that maybe you would have said that or you mean that, this is uh, not high, uh, high it is, and it's not on its potential. It's really what we have in front of the table. And then consider and plan for the potential regulatory impacts of your result. Of course, here, um, this is more a general aspect. It is clear that uh, there is a clear uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory component in this uh, topic. But again, it's very important to keep this in, this in mind because uh, uh, by having the plan, there is a plan as well to engage and that may require some resources in terms of uh, time and budget. Um, in terms of finding partners, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely something that uh, is important that um, we have done the brokerage event, we have this event, uh, but of course, uh, it's, um, it's, it's important for you as well to network with your contacts, to uh, network with the fellow webinar participants, to use some of this partner search tool in order to uh, find uh, uh, people with, uh, with interest or with expertise that would be needed for your consortium. You may get in touch with uh, uh, IHI national contact points and network on social media. So there are many opportunities. There is not one single perfect solution, but by combining all of them, you uh, may uh, reach out of, uh, uh, of uh, partners who will be ready to join and, and form the consortium together and to prepare for the short proposal. And I believe this is the last slide before we move to the, the question. So Catherine, how shall we ask a question for this webinar? Thank you, Natalie and Andrea, for your presentation. So yes, it is now time for questions. And if you have a question, just type it into the chat and uh, I will read them out one by one and we'll go through them. I will add as well, we do have joining us online, Desmond and Domenico from the IHI legal team. So if you have any um, questions more on the rules and procedures, they would be happy to answer them. Having said that, as Natalie said, we have already had a webinar on our rules and procedures where we went into a lot of detail on everything you might possibly want to know on how to apply for IHI, how it works and everything. The recording is online, so are the slides. I would really encourage you um, to go and have a look at it and really take note. And if you have questions, come back to us because obviously IHI is new. Um, another very important point, if you have questions after today on the topic, please send them to us at IHI. Um, you saw Natalie's email address there. You can also send it to the info desk at ihi.europa.eu, but on no account should you send any questions to Andrea or any of the topic writers. Um, we know it's a little confusing at the moment because we're launching two calls in parallel um, at the beginning of IHI here, and the other call is a single stage call where obviously we're actively encouraging you to network with and reach out to industry partners. This here is a two stage call and you should not contact the industry partners. The con industry consortium is preformed. They will join the um, applicants who pass, who are best ranked in the first evaluation and form a full consortium then. So for now, you should not contact them. Okay, 
having laid down the law on that one, I hope, um, we have some questions. Um, and the first one is asking if we can say, what do we mean by pre-competitive? Do you want to start there, Natalie, maybe? Because this is quite a philosophical one on <laughs> IHI. Yes, yeah, so the pre-competitive, or sometimes we say the non-competitive, is really where we can all work together in a sense uh, being not, not until the commercialization of, uh, uh, of a product, but of course, uh, uh, making sure that uh, we, we, we work on, on um, aspects that can be uh, very much um, needed and useful for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Um, and there's a question which is maybe one for our lawyers or maybe Natalie remembers off the top of her head. Um, what is the number of pages for these phase one uh, proposals? So if I'm not mistaken, for the part B is, uh, is uh, 20. Okay. But it is detailed as well yes. in all of yes. the templates and things. And one thing and as well, which I remember they stressed, if you go over, the yes. cutoff will be 20. So even if you've written, you know, the world's best novel um, on the next 20 pages, we will only read the first, well, the evaluators will only read the first 20. Absolutely. So the page the, numbers are strict. Yes, the page number is strict because the... Uh, tool won't allow the evaluator to look at the rest. Okay. Um, and my next question, how many winning projects will there be? For this, there will just be one, yeah. um, which will work together with uh, Andre and his colleagues in stage two. And there is a link there, which my colleague Tom, who's also here, has just put, if you are looking for past webinars, um, he's put the link to the page as well in the chat for you. Um, next question, this one's maybe more for you, Andrea. Uh, legal, ethics and compliance and regulatory experts, should these be included already in the applicant consortium, even if the topic says that this will be provided by the industries? I can take it. I think uh, we, we, we have uh, our uh, legal compliance and regulatory experts uh, for sure. Uh, this is the space where we live as an industry. But I think we are, we are looking really also to the public side of the, uh, you know, in a, take a, a university hospital, take a, a, a research center, you have your regulatory, legal uh, and compliance expertise. And the idea is to merge this expertise because, again, we are doing something that will be of uh, public utility and not only, uh, we cannot see only from uh, one perspective. We need to have uh, this early expertise in order to secure that we, whenever we build these methodologies, is accepted by all parties. Maybe just uh, just to add, indeed, um, uh, even if uh, the um, again we are uh, in this public-private partnership, and we need to have all the different stakeholders around the table. So even if an expertise is brought from the um, uh, predefined industry consortium, we need still to have many more because uh, as uh, Andrea said, we, we need to ensure that all the views are embedded. Uh, so, so that doesn't exclude and on the contrary, uh, we are uh, in a collaborative uh, uh, research where we, we need to bring all the different stakeholders to work together in order to achieve the objective of the topic. Okay, thank you. Next question is asking if you can have the uh, webinar participants and slides. Um, so yes, the slides and the recording will be published on the website, um, on the webinar page, along with the list of participants, obviously including only the people who agreed to have their contact details published in that way. I would add as well that, uh, I mean, Andrea mentioned the event we had on Tuesday. If you go to the uh, IHI website and look for the brokerage event, um, the kickoff and brokerage event on the 14th of June, you will find there as well, you can also view the full list of participants and I think you can even search by who is interested in different uh, topics and things. So that would also be a really good place to look for potential project partners. Um, next question, are there pre-selected use cases by the preformed industry consortium? Uh, we didn't enter in that again. I think it, this will be part, you know, this is the, final step of uh, the methodologies. Uh, definitely today, the six uh, uh, companies that are joining uh, the industry uh, leg of the future public-private partnership, they have their uh, in-house R&D pipelines. Uh, 
there will be products in one year time, two year times ready for be tested uh, to be seen. Uh, I think that I would more transform the question what will be important that uh, the few um, uh, pilot or use cases uh, should cover different technology and different disease area because that's what we want. Uh, and it will be interesting uh, if I can stay always uh, uh, in that area, then maybe uh, someone, uh, uh, one may, may come from a more consolidated uh, uh, industry with a longer tradition, and uh, someone can come from a startup. You see, we need to, we need, is trialing, the goal is trialing the methodology. So we have to, we will have to see that fits the different uh, uh, dimension uh, of the clinic, early clinical investigation phases. Huh? Okay, thank you very much. The next question is more on rules and procedures. Um, can the Ministry of Health or related organs be part of the applicant consortium? Um, maybe I can take that one. Uh, hello, this is Desmond from the IHI legal team. I, I think there's a couple of issues here in relation to this. Uh, the, the key point is based on, our, based on the actual rules that we have. To take part in the actual project as a beneficiary and actually sign the grant agreement, I mean, there are requirements there that first, the beneficiary needs to be a discrete and separate legal entity, vested with its own legal personality, uh, empowered to actually sign the grant agreement and be subject to Belgian law, and also be able to meet the validation criteria, which is laid down by the, the research executive agency who handles all the validation um, work for the tool. So, Frequently, government bodies aren't able to satisfy this criteria. So I don't want to give a blanket no, but I would say the chances are uh, on, on, on past performance that it's unlikely. But what I would say is, you know, this some legwork would have to be done by the potential uh, beneficiary to look at how they themselves are organized. Um, and then first, it's a question of, you know, whether they can actually participate in the first place. And then there's a second question as to whether they can even receive funding. So I don't want to give a blanket a blanket no, but I'd say that it, it, it's in it, it. I would imagine that there would be difficulties that would have to be overcome first. Can I can I make a comment on that, Desmond? Because it's very yeah. well said. Maybe it's the lawyers living in me. <laughs> uh, you, you know that the European. We, if we say we want to, for instance, engage with, we need we need regulators, and we need public regulators. Yes. And in some countries, uh, there are independent agencies, uh, but in some other countries, uh, a department uh, in Ministry of Health. So, you know, I think that a lot will depend uh, from the national uh, legal, juridical organization, because I assume that we don't want to exclude uh, an expertise uh, simply because uh, of some legal constraint uh, or because we want to match only the, the, the Belgian uh, uh, framework. I'm, I'm just putting that on the table. I'm not expecting uh, an answer now, but just to, to keep in mind that uh, we want to be inclusive and we need to have public expertise. Hmm? No, no, sure. As I said, uh, this is why I didn't actually want to give a blanket no. <laughs> but what I would say is that there are um, rules uh, that are hard coded into the IHI legal basis. And as I said, also the requirements from the research executive agency in relation to even using the tool. And these would actually have to be met. But as I said, I, I mean, I think we try to be as inclusive as possible and let's recognize that expertise, which is brought to the projects can come from a number of different places. I think that's generally acknowledged in IHI. So what I would say is that uh, I wouldn't want to rule it out straight away, but I think, that, as I said, we do have these issues that would have to be addressed before we could actually have a beneficiary of that sort joining the actual project. But um, echoing what uh, Catherine actually said, if you're, you have an edge case and you're not actually sure, then I would very much urge you to use the, uh, the InfoDesk facility, um, which the IHI legal team looks at and which we contribute answers to. Submit the question to the to the info desk, and then we can actually give you quite a detailed. Exactly. Even, we're even happy to organise a call uh, on one specific topic if uh, if it remains unclear. So we can engage every step of the way to see if this is actually workable. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and just uh, going back briefly to the brokerage event, so Tom has put the link um, to the event in the chat there as well, so you can go there and find all the participants. Um, another question now, um, should patient organisations be included as a partner or is it sufficient to engage them during the project? Andrea, would you like to start with this one? So I was reading the question. This is the one on the patient. Yes. I think I think I think we welcome patient from the start. That's that's all the story. Early, it's very interesting. If you look, for instance, from an angle of patient safety, there's something completely interesting and innovative to do there because we are engaging patient in a very early clinical investigation where most probably a classical consensus or consent form won't, won't apply. You want to get a, a better understanding of the pathway that are engaging as well as you want to get from patient a patient organization, which are their needs, which are their, how they value a technology from a, a, a clinical perspective. So maybe I can just add one point is that obviously, as um, as uh, Andrea said, uh, um, with this uh, kind of topic, indeed, we would expect uh, to have a patient organization part of the applicant consortium. Now, it may be the case that it's very difficult or that uh, it's, um, that uh, the, the, the consortium didn't manage. But then in that case, I think uh, considering the patient centricity of this uh, topic, that it would be very important to have a way of uh, meaningful engagement. And therefore, in your proposal, you will really need to, to uh, explain how you can reach out uh, to patients in this. But sorry, and budget well. and, uh, and from the, 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 the budget perspective, but to really to how you can really uh, work because that aspect will be definitely looked at by the evaluators. I think this shows again why it's important to really understand mm -hmm. I, I as a whole. And, you know, as Natalie said, patient centricity is really something that's mentioned a lot and, you know, the needs of the user. So, Again, really make sure you understand IHI because that will give you some important background information. Um, next question, and this is again on the topic, should all three of the scopes, i.e. blueprint, stakeholder network and pilot, be included in the project? And Brad, I think we like to, to see that. Huh? We like to see that. We like to make it uh, the most tangible possible. Eh? We have to identify really the outcome and agree on them. Huh? Yes, again, uh, uh, one, uh, so you will see in the topic that these are the scope. So we want uh, all the aspects uh, being uh, being covered in the proposal. So obviously, if you covered only part of it, that will be reflected in the evaluation by the experts. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is there a minimum number of EU countries, for example, in terms of competent authorities or notified bodies that you require within a consortium? Natalie? Well, I would I would say no. Oh, Desmond, exactly. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to let Natalie go first. <laughs> no, but here, I mean, so we, we are not talking here about the number of participants in a consortium. Huh? We are talking about in terms of uh, EU countries represented as part of the applicant consortium in terms of uh, competent authorities mm -hmm. and notify bodies, and I would say no. However, again, since it's a methodology that needs to be somehow applicable across, so again, either uh, uh, if uh, uh, we need to, to or oh, uh, the proposal should should find a way to engage as, uh, as much as possible with everybody, whether they are part of the consortium or a different way to engage. Thank you. And I would just add the reason I think Desmond leapt so excitedly to answer that question is that there is also the question of the minimum uh, number of participants um, that you would have in your consortium. And all of that was explained Indeed. in Friday's webinar. So do look at that yeah. because that's, again, an that's eligibility criteria. Yeah. And if you don't meet that, then you won't be evaluated at all. Whereas this is a question more on the quality in terms of how many countries are covered for this specific purpose. Um, OK, next question. Um, it says there isn't a specific disease area or indication mentioned in the core text. Do you envisage slightly adapted frameworks for use cases across different disease areas or a single framework that would be broadly applicable across disease areas? 
Uh, I would say, and I'll link again, we are setting a methodology. So we are not setting a methodology for a disease area. We are setting a methodology for early stage clinical investigation. And this is horizontal. The use cases uh, will address, as I said, I hope, more than one. It would know if we have to test a methodology, having, uh, I'm inventing now, I don't take my words, but having five use cases in the same disease area, maybe won't be the best we can do as a joint effort, uh, because we want to see different technology from different type of innovators, uh, research center, etc. In different, so it's more rich if we are able to cover more than one disease area. And, but it's not, you, you saw for sure also uh, the other day uh, when we were in Brussels, there are some call, some projects that are very on the disease. Uh, and this is really horizontal. Here is a part of the methodology. So we will be very open to, to, to as we will do the job together, as I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm positive in that, that there will be a public-private partnership to define then as we progress the disease area, we want to test and trial the methodology. Maybe if I can just add, indeed, um, that will be really uh, the work of the consortium when uh, when mm -hmm. starting doing the analysis in order to see, indeed, if there is a need to, from the methodology, to have some specific uh, uh, points addressed depending on the area or depending on whatever. So that would be definitely part of the work of the consortium. Thank you. And then next question, um, is the topic expected to include the entire span of medical technologies from devices to decision support systems, in vitro diagnostics, and also health APPs and digital solutions from prevention, diagnosis, treatment, etc.? Absolutely. Again, it's a methodology. It's not specific for a technology or a family of technologies. Okay. Good short answer. Thank you. Um, next question, can we? Ex can you please explain in detail, now or later, the links and complementarity that you expect in relation to, and there is a link, and the link is to a Horizon 2020 um, call um, on developing methodological approaches for improved clinical investigation and evaluation of high-risk medical devices. So this was a call that was launched by the Commission under Horizon 2020, it looks like, having clicked on the link um, a couple of years ago. There, there, again, we are limiting us, or oh, this is for a technology, for the a family of technologies, high-risk medical devices. We are not limiting to medical devices. We are looking at combined products. We are looking at different, or can be digital remote monitoring, other technology. We are looking at all that. We are setting a methodology for early stage of clinical investigation. It's very specific, but very horizontal. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question saying, uh, patients can be included early even from research hospitals, not necessarily from patient organizations. Um, my, my first reaction would say, yes, why not? Uh, we are not labeling organization. Again, also patient organization depend how they are Apologies for the tautology, how they are organized. Uh, the label can be group of patients, can be family of patients, caregivers. Uh, so there's no, we, we didn't establish uh, selective inclusion or exclusion criteria for patients to participate there. I think here we have to make the distinction between um, the uh, the actual early feasibility studies versus um, the uh, consortium. So if we talk about the consortium, of course, anyone participating in the consortium need to be a legal entity, per se. Um, so he, I'm not so sure if the question was related to uh, the consortium participant partners or more how how we can in early feasibility studies involve patients. So. Uh, I think we have to distinguish both of issues that are slightly different, obviously. 
and uh, in the same uh, area, there is a comment from a patient organization saying we are strong proponents of meaningful involvement of people with lived experience of disease in research at all stages of the research process and not solely as participants or subjects. So, I mean, again, this is making that distinction, which Natalie mentioned just now of patients contributing to the methodology as, you know, active researchers and, of course, patients taking part in the studies themselves. Um, and there's a link there as well. And, and, on, and on the specific, sorry, Katharina, to, to answer to the gentle uh, person of Alzheimer Europe, uh, I was referring especially to also caregivers' organization. Yeah, yeah. Huh? of course. Um, next question, how will the methodology be adopted? What body decides based on which criteria and what do you expect the timeline will be? Hello. Uh, that, that's why we are going to do a public-private partnership, because the methodology is not there. So that will be really the content of the joint work. We put expected timelines of 48 months, but again, as I said, to be discussed when the consortium at the beginning will be put in place. So, and I'm talking under the control of Natalie there, but it will be most probably end of the year uh, beginning of next year, let's say when the public and the private part uh, will uh, will start to work uh, there, we will work also more precise, precise timeline uh, for the project. The rest is really to discuss uh, how uh, to discuss uh, is the critical deliverable of, of, of the public private partnership. Okay, thank you very much. We don't have any questions for now, so I will just remind you that our, um, oh, there is a question that's just come in. What kind of evaluation will be done on the full proposal? So again, the full proposal will be evaluated by an independent um, expert panel, uh, and the independent expert panel will review the proposal in line with evaluation criteria. Um, so the evaluation criteria follow the same as the first stage in the sense that it's again on the um, excellence, impact and quality of the implementation. However, obviously, since we are in the full proposal, there will be more sub criteria that will be looked at by uh, the evaluators when reviewing the full proposal. And of course, there are. And again, I suggest you look yes. at the um, webinar on the rules and procedures as well. Um, but there are um, quality thresholds um, for all of those criteria. So uh, the uh, even though it's not competitive at stage two, and as much as there's only one consortium, it is still a full evaluation. And if you don't meet the quality thresholds in terms of the points per criteria and the total points, it won't be approved. Yeah. Um, another question. It said, uh, someone is not sure, industry, the preformed consortium will contact applicants after stage one. Well, it's more, it's that after stage one, the IHI office will put the industry consortium yes, in touch with the winning applicant consortium. Absolutely, we'll do that. So that will be a process that's facilitated. There was a question about the, just a question. Ah, yes, this. sorry, I missed one. Uh, what could be the expected outcomes of the project? Andrea, I think this is... Hey. Yeah, it's what we said. Uh, what we said earlier. Uh, I'm just saying that to the, just to make sure the expected outcome is to what well, is to fill a vacuum of what we don't have today. As I said, at present we don't have a standardized procedure or framework specific for early feasibility studies. Is that what we want? Yeah. So that's really when we talk about methodologies, is a procedure or framework standardized, accepted by the party and able to make operational and uh, ensure more investment in this very early phase of uh, development. Okay, thank you. And another question, this is more maybe for uh, Desmond, actually, this is a question we've had a few times, actually. What kind of organisation can, in your opinion, be the best coordinator of such a proposal, i.e. HTA body, hospital, etc.? Um, <laughs> speaking, speaking strictly, as the lawyer again, um, I think in terms of the rules, the only two main requirements we have for the coordinator is that A, they be a beneficiary. So you can't have, for instance, a third party uh, as a beneficiary in the actual project. And B, 
if you're going to be the coordinator, we need to make sure, again, from the legal perspective, that you are financially viable because we do look at this and nothing derails a nascent consortium uh, more severely than it turns out that just as they're about to start, it turns out there's a problem with the coordinator and they have to look at appointing a new coordinator. That's the legal part, um, the minimum requirements, what we actually need for a coordinator. In terms then of suitability for the topic that they're addressing, I mean, maybe someone else may have an opinion on that, but from the legal requirements for the consortium are quite clear. Um, and I would take this opportunity if we're asking these kind of questions to refer people who are listening to the annotated model grant agreement, which is available online. Um, the latest version is from the 30th of November, 2021. And it goes into exactly this kind of information in relation to exactly which, which the beneficiaries are, what roles they can actually fulfill, what's asked of them, the kind of information they need to have at their disposal. Um, so that's, that's my legal input on that question. Thank you, Desmond. Um, so, I mean, Desmond already referred to the annotated model grant agreement. I will add as well that obviously this is the very first IHI call. So we're really in the process of finalizing a lot of the documentation relating to the calls. It's going to hit the IHI website very soon. Um, do take the time to read it. It will seem like a lot. And if we're honest, it probably will be a lot. But if you understand IHI, what it is, what we're trying to do, it will really help you. And if anything isn't clear, um, please do ask us. I mean, we've got there's the annotated model grant agreement, which already exists. It's a general one for Horizon Europe. And there is kind of I think there's an annex that uh, refers specifically to the partnerships, including IHI. But uh, it's the Horizon Europe one you need to Google. Um, that's there already. We have a guide for applicants coming out. We have guides on in-kind contributions coming out. FAQs, you name it, it's coming. Um, so uh, do look out for it, take the time to read it. And of course, there is the final version of the topic text, which is uh, the Bible and will be the starting point of the project. Um, so do read it carefully when it all comes out. I don't see any other questions for now. So again, if you have any questions after today, uh, send them to infodesk at ihi.europa.eu. And I will say thank you very much to Natalie and Andrea for uh, your presentations. And so to Desmond as well for answering the questions there. Thank you to Tom as well for the assistance online. Thank you to all of you for your interest in the topic and good luck with your proposals. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks Bye. for helping us, Catherine.